Thank you for coming to a lecture which will shock you again. As I've said, we need this. We are dangerous creatures. There's something bad in us and if God does not control it, if we make not his law, the rule of life, we will end into a big mess. And maybe you've been there. Listen to what's going to happen in this chapter. Chapter 19, a Levite goes to Bethlehem to fetch home his wife. An old man entertains him at Gibeah. The Gibeonites abuse his concubine to death. He divides her into 12 pieces and sends them to the 12 tribes. Gruesome. In this chapter we read about the most gruesome, revolting crime and scandal in the history of Israel, God's people. May God prevent us from sliding down the ladder of ethics and make a mess of life. Oh, we need God so desperately. I've seen wonderful good people who became bad. The tranquility that exists in a country where law is respected and enforced is not always appreciated as it ought to be. The Levite of the former story also had connections in Bethlehem, like the one we're going to study about here. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. These events transpired before the days of the judges. Again, the author prefaces his story of the lawless times and the intertribal strife with an, explan with an explanation that th such things were possible because there was no king, no spiritual leader in Israel to keep law and order. If I don't have King Jesus ruling in my heart, this is what I'm going to become. Tell you old fool ancient Gibeah in Benjamin. This is where the most shocking crime of a concubine transpired, which is recorded in chapters 19 to 21. Concubines were regarded as subservient to a wife. She was lacking the status of even a second wife. Yet it was not a passing affair, in this case, but a regular lasting relationship, as shown by the fact that though her unfaithfulness to him was regarded as reprehensible, the husband sought later to effect a reconciliation. But his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah. And there was four, and was there four months. She had a reason why she ran away, as we will see in the story. Husbands, how do we treat our wives? Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and to bring her back having this servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him in into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. You know, reconciliation is one of the most glorious attitudes one can exhibit, because we are living in a society where there's division, not unity, uh, not attitudes of reconciliation, fights all over the world and in our own hearts. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him and he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank and lodged there. The father-in-law did his best to try and patch up their relationship. We give credit to this in-law. What about your in-laws? How are things going? 
this is always a challenge. But by God's grace, we can be kind and humble. Then it came to pass in the fourth day that they arose early in the morning and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread and afterward go your way. So they sat down and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Please be content to stay all night and let your heart be merry. And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him. So he lodged there again. Then he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. But the young woman's father said, Please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. Again, the father-in-law persuaded them to delay their departure until he could prepare another meal. Evidently, it too was a large feast which the father-in-law did not hurry to prepare and during which there was much leisurely talk. And when, and when the man stood up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young man's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing toward evening. Beautiful words. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here, that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early, so that you may get home. You know, as you'll see in the story, this was the last time he saw his daughter. The greatest scandal happened to that family. However, the man was not willing to spend that night, so he rose and departed and came opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. With him were the two saddled donkeys. His concubine was also with him. Judges contrast the exaggerated hospitality of the father-in-law with a lack of it which the Levites soon experienced in Kibion. As for the Levite, his experience was that of many weak and vacillating souls. First, a necessary delay, and then overstrained hurry. They were near Jebus, and the day was far spent. And the servant sentry said to his master, Come, please, let us turn aside into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into the city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. So he said to his servant, Come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah, Gibeah or in Ramah. And they passed by and went their way and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belonged to Benjamin. Perhaps the Levite knew that Gibeah did not have a good reputation, that it would be better to proceed to Ramah if possible. If he had done it, he would have been safe. Because Ramah was just a few kilometers from there. Today, ancient Ramah is called Al-Ram birthplace of Samuel. They turned aside there to go in to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take him into his house to spend the night. This was customary, an open space of each city, the gate, usually near the gate, the plain, that was used as the marketplace where farmers and merchants displayed their wares. In Gibeah, there were no inns and travellers were dependent upon the hospitality of the inhabitants. The Levite and his company sat down in the marketplace, hoping for someone to offer them shelter for the night. It's getting dark. 
Just then an old man came in from his work in the field at evening, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. He was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of the place were Benjamites. This point is mentioned by the author to contrast the lack of hospitality on the part of the Benjamite inhabitants with the presence of it on the part of the Ephraimite sojourner, the old man. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveller in the open square of the city. And the old man said, Where are you going? And where do you come from? So he said to him, We are passing from Bethlehem to Judah, toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I'm from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah. Now I'm going to the house of the Lord, but there is no one who will take me into his house. Although we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys, and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant, and for the young man who is with you, with your servant, there is no lack of anything. Listen to what the old man is going to tell the Levite. The old man said, Peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. So he brought him into his house and gave him fodder for the donkeys. And they washed their feet and ate and drank. Have you discovered at what speed and unexpectancy crises can overtake you. I've been there and I, I think you too. Listen to the shocking event that followed. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat at the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house, that we may know him carnally. Have these worthless, evil, low-minded, lawless fellows, vile scoundrels, heard what happened to their colleagues at Sodom? You know, every time I visit the ruins of Babedra, ancient Sodom in Jordan, the following verse comes to my mind. See now, I have two daughters, this is Lot, who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to, unto you, and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men, since this is the reason why they come under the shadow of my roof. How did God handle this kind of wickedness? Sodom is. Sodom, that's where the word comes from. What would be happening to the tribe of Benjamin? They should have learned from what happened here. The place was destroyed by fire the following morning. The old man at Gibeah repeated the words that were spoken by Lod. But the man the master of the house went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly, seeing this man has come into my house. Do not commit this outrage. Shocking. Worse than animals. I think we need God desperately because Satan can drag us down to the lowest level of morality. We should deny ourselves. Take up our cross and follow him. That's the safest and happiest way of life. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them and do with them as you please. Oh, this is shocking. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. Although we can appreciate his desire to mind the code of hospitality, Yet the nature of his offer fills us with horror. It reflects the ancient low estimate of womanhood. They were treated 
worse than dogs. The man just, the man must be judged, in part at least, by the wickedness of the times in which he lived. What a mess. But the man would not heed him. So the man took his concubine, listen to this, and brought her out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. The Hebrew ver verb translated took, hazak, it signifies to seize or to take by force. The husband seized the defenseless woman and forced her out, forced her to go out. As daylight approached, the men left, lest their identity became known. The ruins of Gibeah cry out. It happened here, right here, looking at the picture. So cowardice on the part of the Levite was reprehensible in the extreme. He treated her worse than he would treat his dog. Are we going to see more of these kinds of behavior as this wicked world exists for a little while longer? Worse. Then the woman came as the day it was tawny. Can you see her? Suppose she missed her father and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. With her last breath, she had turned to the house with a man who, was, who should have been a protector, but who deserted her in the hour of need. She had strength to crawl just to the door, but probably not enough strength to knock for admittance. Outside the door, she fell dead. When the master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, there was his concubine, fallen at the door of the house, with her hands on the threshold. Hands were upon the threshold as though she had been stretched out to water her husband in one last agony of appeal, please come and help me. And he said to her, get up, and let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her up onto his donkey. And the man got up and went to his place. What a shocking horror scene. It is perhaps no wonder that the poor woman had run away from him in the first place. Listen to the next shocking event. Sorry for reading it. When he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine and divided her into twelve pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. There certainly would have been a less gruesome way to call the tribes together to execute judgment upon the evil men of Gibeah. But by this time the character of the Levite has become sufficiently apparent for us not to be too surprised by his grisly method of notifying the tribes. He was a wicked, a wicked man. And so it was that all who saw it said, No such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. The Levite calculated correctly. The story aroused the moral indignation of all Israel. They recognized that here was such a foul deed that not even the unsettled times and lack of central ruling authority could serve as an excuse to let it go unpunished. Did you get the message of this picture? A word to my fellow men. We may not cut our wives in pieces like the Levite, but what a 
felt the pain caused by the sharp knife of adultery. Talk to the victims and listen to their pain. Lessons. How we treat one another. It is so important. You shall not commit adultery. Exodus 20.14 And ladies, if you want to cut your husband in pieces, the sharp knife of adultery does its cruel job very effectively. And just as a kind reminder to the judgmental holy ones who have not yet fallen physically, but only transgressed in their minds. Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. May this shocking events serve as a warning to us all. Once we yield to one sin, there are no limits to the next, and to the next, and to the next. We have to deny ourselves to enjoy a beautiful life. Father in heaven, what a shocking story. Please help us to be overcome as over our evil nature. And as we enter into this tragic story, speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for watching this presentation. To subscribe to our channel, click here, then click the bell to get notifications. For the next presentation, click here. See you next time.